Welcome to Apostolic Archive. We have gathered many wonderful sermons through the years and we have decided to share them with the world. We hope you enjoy. Please subscribe to our channel. Please like the video and comment with something you take away from this message. Also, hit the bell below so you can receive an update as soon as we upload new content. Blessings. I told one of my sons, I said, I think I'm just going to go through the Christmas playlist and keep the ones that are about winter. And just keep playing those. It doesn't have the words Christmas in it. But I'm glad for the new year too, aren't you? Good to have people getting back into town. Good to have, good to have Brother Sister Peyton back in town. 30 hours each way to Maine. That's a trek there. Good to have you back. Praise God. Others are back from the holidays. Thank you for being here. We want to remember tomorrow begins our three-day fast. We're going to start out the year with three days of prayer and fasting. Tuesday night will be all church prayer at 7 o'clock. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is our three-day fast. Everybody who can, I understand if you're physically not able to do that uh, because of medical condition or whatever, I fully understand that. But if you can at all participate, we encourage you to do so. How many of you believe we ought to bring this year in with the power of the Lord working in our church and in our lives? Amen. And there's nothing that can do that better than prayer and fasting. So let's ask the Lord to help us and, and uh, participate in that. Also, please remember, I want to announce both these things in the second service. Please remember our bread charts are available for you. I believe they're back on the way out of the sanctuary on the table. I'd like for you to read the Bible through this year. Uh, there are several that finished it last year, and we want to recognize them. I know Sister McGavick did, my wife and my daughter did, but Adams. We uh, have some food. Sister O'Neill did. And uh, several. We just want to encourage everybody to read the Bible. Boy, doesn't that sound basic? Let's pray and fast and read our Bible. Kind of good instructions since, since early days of uh, Pentecost. Amen? Like the book of Acts. Days. Thank the Lord. Let's ask the Lord to bless this offering and to have his way. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've given us. We praise you and exalt you. We pray that you would bless our substance as we bless your kingdom, God. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you would bless this church. And as we give to your cause, Lord, let your truth and your kingdom be established in this city. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give. Let's sing and worship the sister.
thank the Lord. Let's sing it one more time. Would you just lift up the Lord as you sing it? And he walks with talk with you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. And I like what I feel in this place today. God is good. Appreciate the worship. God is in the house. Amen. Feels good to be in the new year. And, uh, we are studying the book of Genesis. And we call the series Origins, Relations, uh, the Revelations from Genesis. And I have been excited about this study that we're going to start today. We're not going to get finished with it today. But it's about such an important figure. There is, There are two major stories in Genesis. And the most important one, arguably, is the story of Adam and Eve, and the first sin, the fall of man. But next to that, probably the best known story is the story of Noah and the ark. And what is so significant, as we started out this series, we talked about how important the book of Genesis was because... Uh, it is a microcosm of, of the whole Bible. Though. It points to so much. There's so many types, so many, uh, so many ideas in the Bible uh, found in Genesis and found for the first time. And besides that, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but the, as you know, the New Testament says, as it was in the days of Noah. So, it's important to study how it was in the days of Noah because we're living in that time. Amen? And it's important also to see what kind of person he was in contrast to the times that he lived. Right? So it really originates in Genesis 6. Uh, Noah, the man with a righteous reputation, Today, I'm going to focus on the background and the setting of the story, and I won't get through everything about Noah and the flood and the fall, or, or the, the, the flood all this week, but we're going to introduce it. Uh, if you'll turn with me or read on the screen with me, Genesis 5, uh, 1 through 5, this is backing up from the story of Noah, but we need to find out how we got there. How did things get so bad? Man, it got really bad. And you know, we see a couple of chapters, and it covers a whole lot of territory. Keep in mind that the Old Testament covers 3,600 years of man's history, and the New Testament only covers 100. And the book of Genesis covers thousands of years. And so... Yeah, you, I think it's good to kind of slow down and look in there and find out what's going on because the Bible tells us that uh, all of these things that happened in the past, especially the children of Israel, uh, later are examples for us. How many of you believe? I heard somebody say to me this past week uh, that uh, we were actually talking about getting together for a Bible study. We had our our neighbors over next door, and uh, we had them over for dinner and had a great time and talked about the Lord and 
we'd like to get them in a Bible study. But you know, they made the statement. They said, I don't know that I've ever read the Old Testament. You know, it's the New Testament, basically, that and they're, they're, you know, people that have some type of religious background, but they just haven't ever paid any attention to the Old Testament. There's so much in the Old Testament that is important for us living today. And, and, the, and the New Testament points back to the fact that Noah's day is the same tone, the same problems, the same challenges that face the end time church. Amen? So it's, it's interesting to find out and important to find out what was going on. Genesis 5, 1 through 5, I'm reading from the NIV up here. This is the written account of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And when they were created, he called them man. When Adam had lived 130 years, everybody say 130 years. He had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. Now that's good. What about Cain? What about Abel? When you get into Genesis 5 and the lineage of Adam, they're skipped right over. Cain's not mentioned, but the son of record is Seth. At 130 years, I don't know if you've been to any baby showers for 130-year-old people, but uh, that's when Seth was born. Had a son in his own image, and he named him Seth. And after Seth was born, Adam lived how many years? 800 years and had other, everybody say other, sons and daughters. Now, one of my main goals today is to open your mind to the scope of this set. Adam lived 930 years. Okay? Had Seth when he was 130 years old, and after that, lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. Verse 5, altogether, Adam lived 930 years, and then he died. Isn't that something? I read about some elderly people. George, age 92, and Jane, age 89, were all excited about their decision to get married. 92 and 89. They go for a stroll to discuss wedding plans, and on the way they pass a drugstore. The elderly couple enters the store where George asks to speak to the owner. We're about to get married, George informed him. You sell heart medication? Of course we do, the owner replied. How about support hose to help with poor circulation? Definitely. What about medicine for rheumatism and osteoporosis and arthritis? And George continued, all kinds, said the owner with uh, confidence. How about Depends? Yes, sir. George asked, hearing aid and denture supplies, reading glasses? Yes. What about eye drops and sleeping pills and Geritol and Insure? Absolutely. You sell wheelchairs, walkers, and canes? All kinds and sizes, the owner replied, but why all the questions? George smiled proudly and announced, we'd like to use your store as our bridal register. There it is, 92 and 80, 89. What about 130? Man, I'm telling you, Adam, when you think about the scope of his life, he lived a long time. Adam, although he eventually died, lives to the ripe old age of 930 years. I want you to think about the scope of his life. That is a span of years virtually equal to that which runs from the Norman Conquest in 1066 to the present day. It would be as if William the Conqueror were alive today. Think about that. 
this is amazing. If you went back, Adam's lifespan, if you went back that many years, in time you'd find a medieval world that still believed the sun revolved around the earth. Weaponry and artillery would have went from the catapult to the stealth bomber in your life. Isn't that amazing? Just in our life. Isn't that amazing? But think about living 930 years. England was just being built. I mean, it, all, all of the... <laughs> All of the things that happened, think about all the war. My son, we were discussing this, I was interested, it just kind of fascinated me. And of course, Brian is into medieval things. If you go into his bedroom, he's got a sword hanging on the wall, and you know, all he needs is a big coat of arms. And, uh, he wanted to hang that sword sideways over his bed. And I said, you know, I don't think that's such a good idea. If something happens to the New Madrid fault, you may be decapitated. He likes all that medieval stuff. Would you think about that span of life? Pretty amazing, isn't it? 930 years. And this is something else I want you to consider. I haven't really thought about this. enjoyed studying it. Let's go to the next slide. If you, if you look at it, there's more than half a century from the, from the 874th year in which Lamech is born, which is Noah's father, and the year 930, I'm not using B.C., but I'm using uh, the timeline, 930th year when Adam dies, all nine generations of human beings are alive at the same time. Nine generations. So the world is well populated, and everybody's hanging around. You think Social Security would have a problem now? The graying of America. Let me tell you something. If you started collecting at 65, I, these people, I mean, that would be, you know, over 800 years. Nine generations of human beings are alive at the same time. That's why it's a, the, this next question is ridiculous. Where did Cain get his wife? Give me a break. People that question the Bible and its authenticity come up with that stupid question, where did Cain get his wife? Hello. I think if you got nine generations all living at the same time, 900 years, there's plenty of wives going. Bible says Adam lived 130 years and had Seth and then lived 800 more and had sons and daughters. So if somebody says where did Cain get his wife, say read your Bible. There's a lot of generations that are there. And so what's important to understand about the passage of time brings us to Genesis 6. So from the time of Adam's creation until the time of Noah, which Adam was alive, like we said, half a century while Noah's father was alive. Lemon. That span of time, the, the, the command of the Lord was to be fruitful and multiply, correct? And they did that. They, they populated the world. And, and that brings us to the sixth chapter. Does everybody get kind of the scope of where we are? The world is full of people, and nobody's died of natural causes. Let me make that clear. Of course, Cain killed Abel. But natural causes hasn't taken people. That, this, is a, this is a new thing that's going to happen in their generation. Mr. Melissa's to the sea. God bless you. She's 
glad you all are here. Thank you. Genesis 6, 1 through 8. Let's look at this. Now it came to pass, as the New King James, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful. Everybody say they saw. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. This is a significant change. Okay? Some people believe he was just referring to Noah's time to prepare for the ark, which was 120 years. But uh, most scholars believe that he shortened the span of time that man would live. Hopefully, solving the problem, the chaos, of the chaos and the, the, the problems that man was creating, okay? I mean, you can destroy the world or you can shorten the time span and maybe man will figure out that he's not going to live forever because that wasn't a consideration right then. 930 years was a long time. And not until Adam's death and Seth's death did they consider their own mortality other than unnatural causes, violence, etc. Verse 4, there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the son of sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. I'm going to come back to that. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Man began to multiply. Man began to uh, fill the earth. And man began to fight. And the war and, and the chaos that ensued came to God's intention. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I made them. Man, we mentioned in, last time we covered the book of Genesis that Cain graduated in the sin category very quickly. Corruption doesn't have degree. Lie, uh, Adam's son didn't just tell a lie. Adam's son murdered his brother. It wasn't like Adam's son told a lie, his son embezzled, his son carried out some type of uh, illicit uh, fornication, adultery, whatever, and then uh, his great-great-grandson killed somebody. Wasn't like that. Sin ha doesn't have degree. Corruption doesn't have degree. And so in this, spa in this space of time when nobody's dying of natural causes and there's no natural turnover of population, here's everybody. And then the wars break out, the violence, but Noah, everybody say, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Isn't it important that there was somebody God could count on? If you go back to Genesis 3.15, there's a promise of a Messiah, right? There's a promise of a Messiah. If you wipe them all out, God, there is no chance for redemption. There is no chance to climb from that state to one of, of being saved. There is no more opportunity. But there was a righteous man named Noah that preserved the messianic line for the future. Can I ask you something? Here we are in a day just like Noah. Would God stop at your name and say, I've got somebody that's righteous that can 
carry on the truth, if you carry on the gospel, if you carry on my message to this world, if God was going to wipe out this whole world, would he stop it, you know, and say, there's a righteous person. Don't you want to be that kind of person? Don't you want to be that kind of person? Noah's name, name meant comfort. Noah's name meant rest. In that way, he is a type of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of ways he's a type of Jesus Christ. but Because the Bible said, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And in the middle of this war-ravaged world, and, and where the whole known population was uh, reaching a state of anarchy, all of a the sudden there's a man born named Noah. And God says this is a place where, where the, the mankind can rest and find comfort. I'm going to destroy the whole world. But there's one man that's going to bring, bring rest and comfort to the future of this planet. And that's Noah. That's Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He did what God wanted him to do. Are you doing that? Are you living your life that way? Are you doing what God wants you to do? You know what? It's interesting. When you study the Bible, you don't see any record that anybody helped Noah build the ark. We assume they did. We assume his sons helped. We assume somebody else helped. I know. I guess somebody had to carry something, but there's no record of it. Noah built the ark. Man, Noah worked hard. 120 years. God found somebody that would say, God, whatever you say. God, whatever you want in my life. God, I'll do whatever. No, I haven't ever seen it rain. But I believe. I have faith. By faith, Noah prepared the ark. By faith. Can I ask you something? Are you preparing to get out of here? Same world we live in, just about... Just like Noah lived in. Are you making preparations to get out of here? Are you in the gospel ship? Are you, are you going to make it out of this world when destruction comes? Hey, it never rained in his day, and it has never come down a fiery rain to destroy this world in our day. But I believe, just like the Bible says, uh, that God is going to destroy this earth. And he's coming back for a church that has made itself ready. Can I tell you something? I'm getting off into the ark, but I want to tell you something. There wasn't 1,500 boats out there for people to get on. It wasn't multiple choice. It, doesn't, it wasn't just whatever you believe is going to get you to heaven or whatever you believe is going to get you through this judgment. It was there's one boat and there's one door, and that's the only way to be saved. Is there anybody that really believes that in here? Do you believe that there's, there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism? Or do you believe that whatever you think is going to make it? Come on. Do you believe that whatever you come up with is, is going to get you to heaven? I'm telling you, that's, that's the most damnable lie from hell. People that believe that anything they think is going to be a good enough religion to get them to heaven. You ask the people that live in Noah's time. Interesting. Brother Peyton and I, Sister Peyton and I were discussing this on the way in the service today. Methuselah died the year of the flood. Some scholars believe he drowned in the flood. It's kind of coincidence. He was drowned the same year, and was it was it uh, one of the other? Was it his son that died the same year? What Lamech? What what if? What if, what if they died in the flood? I mean, there's nothing very positive written about Methuselah's life. They said he lived a long time and then he died. No little parentheses in there. He was a really good guy. No, he was a righteous man. What if he lived all that span of time thinking he'd live forever and drown in the flood? You know what? It's not the length of time you have here. That's not what's important. It's what you do with the length of time that you have here that is critical to your eternal, eternal destination. 
You believe that? Praise God. I want you to raise your hands right now and say, Lord, help me live in such a way that I could miss the judgment of God. Help me, Lord Jesus, to understand I am not going to live forever. God, but I've got to live according to your principles and to your word, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you want to preserve your truth, you can count on me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6-2, I'm going to step back and, and go through a few of these verses. Genesis 6, 2 says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all they chose, of whom they chose. They saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful. Boy, that seeing stuff can get you in trouble. Amen? They had the same problem that Eve had. Because way back in Genesis uh it, it already demonstrated in the story of the Garden of Eden how what seems good to the eyes of men can be, be very far from what is truly good or good for them. Eve saw that the fruit please into the eye. Beauty is most of the time less than skin deep. And I try to tell my kids, you know, you... you, you you jump into life, you're going to find some kind of lifelong partner and you're going to base it on how somebody looks. Well, let me tell you something. One car accident can change all that. Amen? One, one medical condition can change all that. All of a sudden, that beautiful person may be incapacitated. Their face may go through a windshield and... And 12 plastic surgeries sometimes can't fix everything. But you know what? we got to base our decisions on more than just what the eye can see. Amen? How many of you know that your, you, you, your naked eye can get you into trouble? And so the, the, the sons of God, I'm going to go into this a, a, a little bit more before we're done here today. The sons of God refer to the godly line of Seth. Now, there is uh, certain theories that uh, refer to uh, the other verses that say, uh, well, verse 4 says, I'm not going to, I'm just going to go on here, brother. For there were giants in the, on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men that they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Some people believe those were fallen angels. I don't believe that. Opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one. I'm not telling you I know, but I don't believe that. I don't believe there's enough scripture to support that. First of all, if the giants were came from some type of uh, angelic union with a physical being... Then they survived the flood because they're mentioned again. And the Bible says all flesh is killed in the flood. That's a problem. And uh, or either there was some type of second invasion of fallen angels after the flood. I don't believe that. I believe that when it refers to the sons of God, the godly line of Seth, which produced Enoch, who walked with God, and was not, for God took him. He had a relationship with God. It produced Lamech and, and then Noah. That was a godly line. And then the ungodly line of Cain, who produced another man of the same name, but a different man, Lamech. And he boasted of being a murderer. And, uh, and, and so the, the scripture indicates that the godly line of Seth intermarried and, and, and went and took wives of the evil line of Cain and uh, based it on, on 
obviously the wrong things. Uh, the pursuit of the beautiful daughters across tribal lines caused trouble, and the sons of God notice the daughters of men, and they take them as wives. Uh, appearances are often deceiving, as we said. Did they really see? Did Eve really see when she observed the fruit? I don't think she was really seeing. I believe that, uh, as I preached here before, hearing is a much more accurate way to find the will of God. Amen. Uh, preached the message here about the sound of God. I don't know if the heralds are in yet, but it's in the form of an article in the January Herald, if you want to refresh your memory on that. But uh, I believe we need to hear the voice of God, and it needs to supersede what we see with our naked eye. Amen. Elijah, come on. Elijah saw the earthquake. He saw the, the ground splitting. He saw the fire. He saw all of the things happening. But then when all of the visual things were gone, he heard a still, small voice. Amen? And uh, your eyes can deceive you. And the sons of God, the godly line of Seth, was deceived by the beauty of the daughters of men, which I believe represents Cain's line. I want to just take a step further and, and go a little further into the background and the setting. Noah represents, and I've referred to this, Noah represents the first generation that knew of their own mortality, the first man who grows up knowing that he must die. Nine generations living simultaneously, but perhaps what became a factor in the way they were living is the same attitude today that uh, you ought to live fast and die young and leave a good-looking corpse. You know, that, that whole attitude is very prevalent today. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's the attitude in the world today. The warning is there. It's appointed unto man once to die. After that, the judgment... But I heard somebody say, you know, the only warning label people really obey is that dry clean place. You can have on a pack of cigarettes. This is going to kill you. It's going to cause lung cancer. It's going to eat up your lungs. and It's going to cause heart disease and everything else. And people just puff away. You, you can have warnings on x-ray machines and different things with radiation. People just work around it all the time. But if you get that dry cleaning out and it says, do not wash, you take it to the dry cleaners. Man, people listen to that. Don't throw that in the wash. My goodness, you're going to ruin that. What about your body? For goodness sake? What about your health? Noah represented the first generation that understood their, or saw their own mortality. Now that would put a different slant on life, wouldn't it? And it became so chaotic and so, so uh, full of anarchy. Uh, I'm going to skip verse 5 because I've already mentioned it. Verse, or verse 4, and let's go to verse 5. The Bible says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man. Everybody say the wickedness. Was very great in the earth. Everybody say very great. I want you to... I want you to pay attention to the language in this verse. And that every, everybody say every, intent of the thoughts of his heart was only, everybody say only, evil continually. Could you have a more descriptive verse of a group of people that were, that were just hell-bent, if you please, on, on doing the wrong thing. The Bible said wickedness was great. Every, do you think every means every? Or do you think that, would it say most if it meant most? It says every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only, there's another pretty emphatic word, only evil continues. Can I ask you something? 
Couldn't you superimpose that same verse on our generation? Couldn't you place that epitaph over the time that we live? I'm telling you, you just pick up your newspaper and you can find, uh, what, what was it we saw in the paper uh, today about a child that had been abused, and signs of old, old breaks and, and, and physical abuse? Just a child? Come on, where, how far have we come? As somebody said when I was growing up, if God waits much longer, he's going to have to apologize. To the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, to the people that were in the flood. Because this is the day we are living in. This is the time when we are living. It became so chaotic. And Luke 17, 26 and 27 bears it out that it reflects our time. Let's read it out loud together. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. A generation that initially thought they would live forever, that found out maybe that wasn't going to happen, so we might as well go crazy. They did not restrain themselves. There was no self-control display. Isn't that right? I could just open up any magazine or newspaper and show you the same thing going on in our world today. It's the exact same atmosphere that was in the days of Noah. But I know God didn't end that passage with just that. He said, but there was no. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the text, in the scripture, it indicates almost that God looked at the evil of the world, but that his gaze was intent on no. It said that God saw the wickedness of man, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Don't you want to be that person that's different? Don't you want to be that child of God that stands up in the middle of an evil generation and says God is still on the throne and I'm still going to please Him. It doesn't matter the world that I live in. I'm going to do the, the will of God in my life. If you feel that way, would you stand to your feet right now and, and just raise your hands to the Lord and, and ask God to help you to be like Noah in the middle of a perverse generation can there be some comfort? Can there be some rest? Can there be someone that stands out from the crowd and says, God, you can count on me. I will be there for you. I am going to be the one that you can look to that will carry out your will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11 in the in the chapter of the heroes of faith, it said, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Are you moving with godly fear and respect for the Word of God? Are we living our lives in the light of eternity? Are we really truly considering what the ramifications of our actions are? In the end of it all, are you going to be on the boat? Or are you going to be clamoring at the door saying, open up. Open up. Here's the key. Faith. By faith he moved with you. And prepared. Everybody say he prepared. Are you prepared? Oh, well, I've... I've, I've Repenting of my sins. I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I got the Holy Ghost. I didn't ask you that. Are you prepared? Are you living an overcoming life? Is there anything in your spirit that would keep you out of the ark? Let me tell you something. You can miss heaven just as much for a foul spirit as you can for never having been baptized.
If your heart's not right with God, I know God loves you, but you know what? We need to make sure we're righteous like Noah and that we don't have anything in our heart and our spirit that would keep us from being on that boat. Whenever I do my Bible studies, I like to ask people, you know, if you're in the boat, you're what? And I let them fill in the blank. If you're in the boat, you're what? Uh, dry? Safe? You live? Saved? All of the above. There's no wrong answer there. Nobody ever gets it wrong. If you're not in the boat, you're what? Dead? Drowned? Wet? Going down for the last time? Lost? Yeah, that's right. There wasn't any other vehicle out there. Can I tell you something? Jesus is the only way. His word is the only way. You have got to give yourself to God and respond to his truth. Amen? If you've given your life to the Lord, if you've obeyed his word, that's awesome. We still got to be sure we're on the boat, don't we? Amen? I wonder if you join hands with somebody next to you. Let's pray for one another. God, I want to be on that boat. I want you to be able to count on me in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. In the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. We need you. God, we need your presence in our lives. Working, God, in us. Oh, Jesus, in your name. We want to be saved, God. We want to make it to heaven. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just talk to him right now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. God, have your way in my heart, Jesus. I want to respond to your call like Noah did. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. I believe God can see you through everything. I believe I don't have to be afraid of what's going to happen to this world because my faith is in someone that transcends this planet. He said, if my spirit, if the spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken your mortal body. You're going to get out of here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God. I'm looking forward to that. In Jesus' name. We're going to break for a few minutes. I want you to greet everybody you can. Let's come back and worship together. Thank the Lord. God bless you for being here. I'm glad for each one of our visitors. Saw some more come in. Praise God. We want you to feel at home. We want you to enjoy yourself today. Thank the Lord. Find somebody that you haven't spoken to and greet them in Jesus' name.